Irish seafood. Easy to prepare and easy to cook for everyday meals. Today on my food trails, I'm in West Cork and I'm starting in Baltimore to go fishing for common prawns or pink shrimp as they're sometimes called with Corny Bahan. We don't eat a lot of this type of prawn in Ireland, but they love them on the continent and we export 250 tonnes every year, more than half of the EU's total catch. Great. This is a first for me, shrimp fishing. First time? Yeah, never done it. Oh, so how far are we going out now here? Tell me where we're going. We're only going to go out and haul maybe one short string now this morning. We have about close to 400 pots. We take the shrimp to Castellon Bay, of course, uh, to Shellfish, to Limeira and yeah. Nova. Yeah. They collect them from us here. At what time of the year do you go out in the boats catching shrimp? It starts on the 1st of August. For us in the harbour, it usually finishes in mid-November. And is there a good time of the day? Is it evening, morning? We usually go out early because they're collected every day, maybe between one and three. We have to try and get in as many pots as we can in that much time. And on a good day, how many pots would you get in? We usually haul about 200. And who helps you? My son there, Paddy. Paddy. He yeah, usually Paddy, comes good man. home every year. He spends most of his time in New Zealand. Does he? Pick up the boy there now, Paddy. Oh, you can see them. You can see them hopping. Look at this. Yeah. <laughs> it's like they're dancing. They're dancing away. So what bait do you feed them? We usually put uh, blue whiting in. These are the blue whitings. What, is there a hook to hold on There's to them? There's a hook to hold them on inside, yeah. yeah. They go in this yeah, in little there. hole here and they can get out there. Ah. Because it's kind of cone-shaped inside. OK. So when they go in, they can't come back out. There's a few there, are you? You've got a mixture. So every time you pull a pot out, you put the bait back in and then That's it's ready right. for... When did these go down? Yesterday? Two days ago, two so days they, we leave them there now again for another two days. So every two days? Every two days we kind of uh, rebait them. You'll get really good shrimp when the water is yes. clear as well, you know, it's fantastic down here. So where do these shrimps go to? Exported or an Ireland market? The majority of these are exported to France and Spain. I wouldn't know the exact percentage, but well, I'd 95%. say... 95 percent. Yeah. For some strange reason, very few Irish eat them. The meat is so sweet. It's sweet. Every week we'll take home maybe a kilo of them, cook them up, have them on warm, just on brown bread, you know, straight out of the pot on some soda bread and butter. That's why you come back from New Zealand. For the That's golden it. harvest. <laughs> Over 50% of Europe's shrimp are caught in Ireland. Is that right? Which is incredible, yeah. Are you happy with your haul? So That's you good enough, yeah. Is it? Yeah. So we'll shoot all these back now, won't we? It's about four fathom, and they put should be about 24 feet between each pot. Sometimes you might change to a different patch of ground, you know. If you thought this was overfished, it's good to give it a break at times. So the whiting's already in it. The blue whiting's in it. Mm -hmm. Ready for it to fish for another couple of days. Okay. That should be enough to get a few shrimp in the pot. I, I can't believe how close we're to the shore here. Very close, yeah. yeah. So this is a grater from BIM. Mm -hmm. It's okay. an eight mil grater. You shake the shrimp over the side and all the small ones will go ah. back into the water here. It's crucial for sustainable fishing, and you get a better price for your shrimp as well, you know, if the small ones aren't there. But it's all about sustainability and fishing for the future. Pour a few of them in here. Maybe half. Yep. Put them or hold them down there. Out of the way. We'll just put them on the side here and shake them like that. You can see the small ones going down, you know? The seagulls are here for their dinner. They know what's coming. So you got the majority of the small ones are gone there now. Yeah, and then they go back in there. Back in here. Excellent. Pick whatever else is left. So how much catch do you think you got there? We have about a kilo and a half there to two kilos now. They're very good quality. So lads, before the rain comes on, we'll take them ashore and we'll cook some. Thanks That's so great. much. You're You're great. Power set. Absolutely You're lovely. very welcome. Thank you. You work hard. Back in Baltimore, you and Jacob, owner of the Waterfront Hotel, cooked the prawns for me. This is a very simple operation. Tip the prawns into rapidly boiling water, bring the water back to the boil, and then cook for three minutes. 
Once the prawns are strained, Ewan runs cold water over them to stop them from cooking any further, and he serves them with homemade mayonnaise. I was supposed to go whale watching with Michal Cothrill from Baltimore Sea Safari, but the weather got the better of us, so we ended up eating the prawns instead. Yeah, it's hard to believe half an hour ago we were out in the boat and it was raining and the wind was coming up and it's changed. One thing I've learned since I've come down here, the weather changes so quickly because we were meant to go out whale watching with yourself. Tell me how it works. What we do is we coastal sightseeing uh, and whale and dolphin watching. So we'll go to seal colonies, we go to sea, sea caves, um, you know, some great maritime history all along the coastline here. So we give the people a feel of what's happening in maritime history and we have the whale and dolphin watching as well. This part of the coastline is great for whales and dolphins. You know, you get um, common dolphin, you know, in close to shore. This time of the year, you'd have minke whale, um, which are about seven to 10 meters in length for an adult. Later on, next few weeks, hopefully the fin whale will start arriving in. They're the second largest mammal on the planet after the blue whale. Still come in all close to the shore after herring and sprat. So there's many different varieties in this area? Um, you get minke whale are the most common sighted and they're the most abundant whale in the ocean. So we get minke whale in usually from about April to about mid or late December, and then they push back out offshore. Uh, humpback whales arrive in different times through the year. Earlier on this year, we had them from April to about June, just down the coast, more towards the stags, just east of the coast. Um, they'll hopefully arrive in again, maybe October, November again, you know, once the herring starts in. And fin whale come in as well quite a bit. But throughout the year, then you get different species, you know, sometimes pilot whale off, you know, west of the fast or west, you know, on the porcupine bank places. Blue whales pass you know, up and down the, the channel all the time at the west of the porcupine bank, the deep water. And do you do your tours all year round? We usually start at March or April and run then. We'll set the end of October normally as our target to reach that and anything else is a bonus, but it depends on the weather, you know, so it's weather, it's very weather driven. You know, it's my first time in Baltimore. It's a beautiful part of the world. It's a very quaint, small town, isn't it? It is a small, I mean, you know, you have a wintertime population, just over 400 people. Brilliant maritime history, you know, going way back. Piracy era from the O'Driscolls, you know, um, the original castle here. Yeah, was, that's a beautiful uh, building. The original town. was built about 1215 by a Norman called Sliney, but the O'Driscolls and McCarthy's ousted him. The O'Driscolls took control of the castle. And then 1537, there was a dispute with some water for men over a bit of wine that the O'Driscolls took off in the Piracy Act. So they paid mercenaries who bombarded the original castle and burnt it. So this, what's not here is known as a fortified house. That was a replacement for us. Great history here. In there is. 1631, Algerian pirates arrived here and they took 104 men, women and children to slavery in Algeria from here. You know, what was famously called the Sack of Baltimore. So that led to most of the population actually moving to Skibbereen to live up there, get away from all this piracy nonsense. And for your whale tours, do you have to go far out to sea? Not too far offshore. It can all happen within a few kilometres of the coastline. Once the feed is inshore, that's where they'll be, you know. And how long would the tour last? Uh, tour lasts just over two hours. These are amazing, these shrimp. When you think of it, they were caught literally 45 minutes ago and they're cooked and all. Oh, how do you like yours? Simple, natural? Simple, just drill yeah. on the water, yeah. Show me yeah. how you peel so, them. Work this time. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Brilliant. Irish people think they're very fiddly. It's all about practice. It's all about opening it. Yeah. It is all about opening. Well, it's my first time here in Baltimore, but it won't be my last. Gentlemen. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we'll finish the prawns, will yeah. we? <laughs>There are lots of wonderful festivals in Ireland that celebrate the very best of Irish food. And one of them is the Taste of West Cork, which is held every September. Tonight, I'm here in Casey's in Baltimore, and they have a very special event planned for their guests, a seafood surprise. Vicky, what an impressive display of locally caught fish and shellfish. And now I know you're busy, you have a lot of full dining room. How many guests have you got here? Well, I think we've got about 60. It's full now for today for the Taste of West Cork, okay. yeah, which we're delighted, yeah. I know they're all biting at the bit <laughs> to get in, so will you run through what we have I will, here? yeah. So here on this section we have all the smoked, so you have like a little bit of Union Hall smoked salmon, Sally Barnes woodcock tuna, and a bit of Sally's cold smoked haddock, which Beautiful. just has a squish of lemon for flavour. These are Corny Bohans, a local man just caught them there today for us. We were out in this boat yeah. this morning. Oh yes, or you would have brought That's them in for, yeah. the, for the meal, that was brilliant. And then we have some like a dress crab, it's the full crab, so you have the brown and the white. And this is a beautiful crayfish, uh, steamed, and just a little bit of lemon juice, salt, pepper. Here we have a whole cod, which we've just poached, and just a little dressing. And then here we have the Kedrick prawns. Gorgeous. In and here? Yeah, these are our own mussels. These are just steamed. These are beautiful, like with just a little simple onion, white wine and garlic. Beautiful. Perfect. And then we have pan-fried fresh mackerel that just came in this evening. Just caught them there display. for us. Yeah. And more prawns and different dressings. And yeah. tomorrow we're going to cook the crab? Yeah, hopefully, yeah. I'll show you how to do dress the crab. Brilliant. Well, listen, have a great night. Yeah. See you in the morning. Cheers, thanks okay. for having Thank you.
So this is the cooked here. So how, yeah. tell me how you cook this. Okay, so I just put this into boiling hot water. Mm -hmm. So it's roughly about eight liters to 150 grams of salt. From 900 grams, you cook about 20 minutes. You don't cool it, you let it cool itself naturally. So um, it's better for you if you take the meat while it's still a little bit warm, like while you can touch it. So it's easier to take out the meat. The meat doesn't stick to the shell. So what are we going to do with it? So we're just go we're going to dismantle this crab like it's for a dress crab. Yes. Take off these. These are the little the legs, yeah. and we want to to kind of pull away from the the body as much as possible to get most of it. We're so lucky that we have some of the best water, you know, clean water for yeah. shellfish. We export so much crab now yeah. to France, to China now, and I think Irish people should really enjoy crab because you can get it and cook it in so many different ways oh, yeah, you can get definitely. a clean cooked very versatile. You, you don't have to get it like the way that we're going to show you now. Yes. You can buy this cooked inside the fishmonger so there's no hassle. Take off the claws, break this off. So that's your claws. So we're just going to take this off. This is okay. you don't. no good. You just get to the back lie flat and you should be able to push it up like that. Just like that. Push yeah, it up. yeah. So this is the, the juice, so I think this is really good. So we'll have a bowl for brown, so this juice is good. And really flavoursome. Yeah, sweet, really flavoursome, yeah. So first we're going to take out, these are dead man's fingers. They're not poisonous, they're just bitter. So we're just going to remove all that. So this is the stomach sac, so you can't eat that, right? Okay. So that's, you that's... definitely have to get rid of that. And then there's this is the top nose, just pull that off. So that's the lie. So this is all good meat now, so I'll just take that into this. Lovely brown tamale meat, it's like the roe, so that's all that there. So it's lovely in chowder, if you want to, you know... Enrich, doesn't it? Yeah, doesn't it really give yeah, a great give it flavor? And in risottos or pasta, see the line, there's a line. Yes. Oh, so we're just, there. Yeah, and then you will end up with a beautiful flat for your dress crab leg. So that'd be a beautiful flat. I like area. the way you use the back of the knife. Because the heel that's, would damage yeah, your knife, yeah, yeah. yeah. So we're going to take the meat so out of the claw first. Yes. So you break it off, so you have the, mm -hmm. this part, quite straightforward. That's, and then you yeah. just pull it off. So just check if there's anything left. So you're going to use your cracker. Pick it out, is that the word? Yeah, uh, your, your picker and just lightly pick it out. Let's crack him a little bit now, because he's going to be tough. Crack then with the cracker, the knuckle. And the same, you take out the meat. Take out any of this part that's there. Because it's kind of still warm, there's nothing yeah. really sticking to the cavity. So this is the toast. You didn't hit it too hard. No, just I don't just... want it to yeah. crack into it. So that's Back your little to toast. So then you do the legs. So the legs is the same. I didn't realise there was as much meat in the legs. Yeah, there's quite a lot, really. You'd be surprised what you get out of the... the... Yeah, look at that. Look yeah, it's really, it just really comes out loads. So this is underneath the body. So there's actually quite a lot of meat in here. So we're just going to cut this. Yeah. And some people cut it by half, okay. which might make it easier for you. OK. So you have in here a lot of white meat in here. It should all come out gently for you, like. So, Nevin, I'll show you how to dress it now. Lovely. Yeah. So we're just going to put the brown on the bottom. And it's just giving the flavour of the beautiful brown crab. So we're just going to sit this gently on the top. So we're not going to add anything into this because this is full of flavour already. Keep it natural. Yeah. Right. So that's all we're doing. We're just leaving it quite simple on the Perfect. top. And if you'd just like to pass yeah, me the plate, so. please, yeah. So what have we got here? So we just have a simple bit of lettuce and we've just given you a choice. So we're just going to serve it like this on the little side with a small... Lemon. So what are your sauces? This is a bit of Mary Rose sauce, mm -hmm. so they're all made in-house, and a bit of mayonnaise, and this is just beautiful sea salt. So then you have the option, then, if you want to salt okay. it. Mayonnaise is a tiny bit in the top. Just a little sprinkle of the dill, anywhere you like. Doesn't Open that look it. gorgeous? It's like the best crab you'll ever eat. <laughs> it's sweet, it's so fresh, it's just fantastic. It's Vicky, beautiful, beautiful dish. Cheers, thanks a lot. Thanks for being on the show. Board Beer, bringing Irish seafood to the world. Board Beer, bringing Irish seafood to the world. 
I first heard about the renowned Sally Barnes when I was a young chef. Sally has a well-deserved reputation as one of the country's finest fish smokers, and the Woodcock Smokery in Roscarbery is where it all happens. Here I've got beautiful, fresh, locally caught haddock. Look at this, the line. Haddock, the line, and St. Peter's Mark. So, these are fresh caught by local boats, and now I'm going to put them into the brine here that I made earlier. And Sally, do you always brine them and smoke them with the skin on? I do. It's a very delicate flake in a haddock, and if we took the skin off, it would fall apart. Haddock eat mostly shellfish, okay. so they're very sweet. They're beautiful, beautiful fish. I'm just putting them into a saturated salt solution. It's so saturated, the fish will actually float ah. in it. And do you always get them filleted, pin-boned? I get them filleted, they're not pin-boned. Okay. I'll do that myself. The lads know me, and they're looking at the gills. I trust them totally. They know I want the sparkling fish. I can't use fish that's two or three days out on a boat. It has to be really fresh. And I'll just flip them over now, so they're face down. I'm a Scot. It's our national fish. Mad for haddock, the Scots. Right, those babies are safe. And I'll just set my timer because I forget. And how long do you leave them in the brine liquid there? 20 minutes. And we'll just have a look at some that we finished yesterday. OK. There we are. Now, look at these. beautiful hue on them. And you can see the surface is dry. The whole purpose of smoking is to create an antimicrobial environment to arrest the development of microbes that would break down the fish that might be harmful to humans. So you can see we've got a lovely sheen on yeah, the, you can on see the that. surface. Huh? So when they come out of the brine, yes. you don't dry them? No, I don't dry them. If you dry them, you're already creating what they call a pellicle, which will stop smoke from penetrating. You don't want to oversmoke it. You don't want to have something that tastes like a bonfire. You want the taste of... And I'm That's using it. beech which gives it this beautiful yellow colour. You know, there's no dyes in this. So, so how long in a smoker? These have had about eight hours. It depends entirely on atmospheric humidity. One of the most important bits of kit is the hygrometer, which tells me what the atmospheric humidity is, because okay. that's going to determine how long the whole process is going to take. And it's experience that teaches me if we've got 99% humidity, 10 hours is barely going to touch that. But yesterday we had about 76% humidity during the afternoon when I started these. So they smoked in about seven or eight hours. As a Scot, we love our fish soup. And one of the best fish soups is called Cullen Skink. Cullen's a small fishing village in Aberdeenshire. And it's smoked haddock. Potato, onion and milk. Oh. Sauté off your onion first. And when it's just translucent, I have my potatoes peeled and chopped. Throw them in, just sweat them around a little bit. And then add milk. A litre of good whole, I use organic milk. Simmer it, don't boil it because you'll split it. And simmer it until the potato's just soft. Skin the fish, chop it into pieces, drop it in. Three minutes, done. It's all done within 20 minutes, it's fab. I'm just going to acidulate this a little with okay. lime, which I prefer to lemon. Why? I, I think it's, it's, it's a bit sweeter, which sounds weird for an yeah. acid, but I think it's not as aggressive not as harsh. a lemon could be. Yeah, yeah, okay. that's a good word. And just a little drizzle of oil. Yes. Just taste a little bit of this. So just oh, a little bit of lime. Uh-huh. Mm. Wow, I love that. Isn't that good? Oh, super. It's so sweet. And you know, and it's sweet and mm. it's not overly smoked, as you mm. said, really moist. It's a mm. lovely fish haddock. Fabulous fish, it. yeah. Very fine flavour. Now you get the smoke at the end. Mm. I'll just have to finish this, you don't mind. Mm. OK. Right. Delicious. It's good, isn't it? Oh, that's super. So, Sally, when it comes out, mm -hmm. you'll pin bone it like mm -hmm. you've done. Mm -hmm. You'll vacuum it. Mm -hmm. Then put your logo stick or whatever. And then it'll six and then it weeks. Goes. Six, that's it. Six weeks shelf. <laughs> I want to be producing fish that's going to give somebody a brilliant experience. Well, I've just had a brilliant experience. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Listen, it's such a privilege being here. I've known you since I've been a young chef yeah. through the years. Yeah. I love your passion. I love Thank what you, you do. Thank and just you. I a huge admirer of your work. Thank yeah, you so much. That's very mutual. <laughs> I love what you're, you're doing You're a great as woman. Well. Thank, Thank you, you, Sally. Thanks for being on the show. This is a traditional French fish soup that fishermen used to make using eel and rockfish and lots of vegetables. So like chowder, there's lots of variations of this recipe. But the difference in this and chowder is that there's no cream. It's a tomato-based one. So we need to get our base done. The herb I'm going to use 
first of all is bay leaf. So I'm going to just literally just tear that, just to release the flavour. So you've got to be careful with bay leaf because it's a lovely aromatic herb, but too much of it can overpower. A good slug of some rapeseed, or you can use some olive oil in this. So a good drizzle of that. And then we're going to get all our lovely vegetables in here. Some leeks. These are little baby leeks. Regular leeks are fine. Just make sure that they're washed. Your tomatoes. Your onions, which are sliced. And then some peppers. So this is going to give lovely flavour, a little bit of sweetness and some colour, and a touch of chilli. The chilli is optional, so I've just used half a chilli. It's not overly spicy. It's a lovely aromatic soup. And then our fennel into the pan, and then throw in the bay leaf. So there's lots of colour. There's going to be really nice flavour in this. And I'm just going to let that just cook out for a minute or two. So the best way to do this is to put the lid on it and just let it cook. So I'm going to put in some saffron. Saffron is one of the most expensive spices. This is some Spanish saffron. I'm going to put some in there. The rind of an orange. So we're going to use a potato peeler. So I'm just going to peel it. And we're going to put in two or three of these. So if you're peeling a potato. So four of them should be enough. And then we're going to put in some, one of my favourite spices, star anise. I love this. Poaching fish, steaming fish, it's gorgeous. Even in fresh fruit salad, it's delicious, so it is. So let's come back over here. Give this a little stir. And immediately what I can smell is a little touch of the chilli, but the bay leaf. I'm going to throw in the two star anise and just a couple of little strips of the orange. And then saffron. So a nice, generous pinch. Sprinkle that all over here. It works really well with the tomato base in this tomato puree. Spoonful of this, and then I'm just going to stir this all through. So there's no flour in this. It's a really lovely, light, aromatic soup. If you don't have fresh tomatoes, you can use a can of lovely plum tomatoes in this. So I've seen some recipes with white wine in this, but I'm going to use some perno. So when you think of it, the fennel bulb, that's an aniseed flavour. Then we have the star anise, and then the perno. So a good splash of this. It works really well with fish in a sauce. Now, just let that cook out. So in the saucepan here, I have a little bit of homemade fish stock. And how we make that is just using some white fish. So that could be haddock, cod, turbot, monkfish tails, but it's the bones you're using and any of the trimmings. You put them into a saucepan, cover them with some water, a little bit of leek, a little bit of onion, star anise, white wine, a little bit of herb, maybe fennel. It's gorgeous. And you cook it for 20, 25 minutes. So it cooks really, really fast. So this is some warm stock here. We've softened all our vegetables. They're not fully cooked. We're going to bring this to the boil. Stir that through, and now I can get the aniseed. Now I can get the orange. And it's interesting, orange with fish, but it works really, really well in the soup. So that needs to come to the boil. We put the lid in that. Now I'm going to talk through the lovely fish and shellfish that we're going to be using in this recipe. So we have a lovely selection of Irish shellfish and fish. So always make sure when you're getting your fish, you know where it comes from. Support your local fishmonger, really important. First one here is monkfish. Quite a firm texture, I love this. So it's taken off the bone and there's no membrane. So it's classed as a round fish. Then we have some white in here and I've kept the skin on this. Removed any scales that are on it and there's obviously no bones whatsoever. Then some lovely Dublin Bay prawns are known as langoustines. These are just fantastic. Some mussels. Obviously wash them, remove the beard, and uh, we're going to put these in. And then some hake. And what I've done, I've used the tail of the hake. It's not the centre loin, removed any of the excess scales and the, obviously the skin is on it. You can use cod, you can use haddock. One thing I wouldn't put into this is maybe salmon or trout or that. It's kind of a white fish, which was traditionally used in this. So this is coming to the boil. So in goes our mussels. Sprinkle them all over. And then our Dublin Bay prawns. They're lovely and sweet. Them are beautiful whiting. You can see I've cut it like a little angle like that and it looks really nice for presentation. And them are monkfish. So this doesn't take long at all. We just need to put a little bit of salt and pepper and we're actually poaching the fish and the shellfish in this beautiful soup. Just push it down. And this will take eight, 10 minutes, no longer than that. A little touch of salt. The lid goes on. You bring it to the boil and then you let it simmer. And this is gonna take about eight to 10 minutes until it's just beautifully cooked. So after eight minutes, your fish should be cooked. And just to make sure, we'll just take a little bit of the monkfish and we'll put it on the board just to make sure that it's cooked through. That's falling apart, it's moist. So you're keeping all the flavour in the pot. That's exactly what you want. So we're not going to waste that. Taste it, see if it's enough season. I think it needs a bit more. Because in a homemade fish stock, you don't use salt. So then you can adjust the seasoning and then some fresh basil. 
just kind of tear it like that. So fresh herbs are just at the end. You could use some of the little sprigs of the fennel bulb if you want in this, or dill. Now, so I'll just try and get some of the vegetables down at the bottom. Look at that. So you have a little bit of monkfish or whiting, hake. The mussels are opened up. And just be gentle, because when the fish is kind of poached in this, it can fall apart. And then the lovely langoustine. So when you cook it in the shell like that, so much flavor. So that is a meal in a bowl, if there ever is one. Traditionally, what they would do is toast some bread and serve with a little bit of garlic or saffron mayonnaise and just serve with some crusty bread. Works really well. So it's a beautiful use of Irish seafood. And that's my traditional French fisherman soup. Irish seafood. Easy to prepare and easy to cook for everyday meals.